So we, we solved the technical problems afterwards. We first um, delve into our last session. Babu asked me to orchestrate uh, the final discussion. I don't know how to orchestrate the discussion, I have to admit. I thought the discussion was something more democratic in a way. Uh, I can try to initiate it, but there's no um, musical sheet or musical score or so to follow. Um, so uh, let me begin uh, uh, by, uh, by thanking the organizers, actually, and the initiators of this, um, um, Babu and, and Roy, as I understand, uh, for, for bringing us together here. I think it was an inspiring two days um, uh, where uh, we could discuss about practices of uh, calculation, of measurement, uh, administrative practices, and so on, in various um, uh, societal contexts, in various uh, historical contexts, uh, I think this was really inspiring. And so thank you very much. Um, um, so um, uh, after each talk, we already had a lot of uh, discussions about um, about the contents and the contexts of what was discussed, but I want to uh, remind uh, everybody of the questions that uh, Babu sent us, I think, before, um, uh, before this event um, as a kind of leading questions. I just want to read them out and uh, to um, uh, make us think again how we can bring the different um, examples together and where this uh, leads us or um, in which direction. Um, this may be going. So uh, the first question was um, had to do uh, with who will be the primary historical agent in the history of standardization. That is um, the state or the practitioner or the public. And um, I think we discussed this in many concrete cases and maybe we can um, now in this last round um, have a, a broader reflection on um, patterns um, that emerge from the different uh, historical settings that we inquired into. Uh, so uh, who are the agents? Uh, this is, I think, related also to the question um, who is in possession of the knowledge, who uh, has uh, the say about it. It has to do with questions of uh, abstraction and alienation, I think, who is uh, uh, the one who uh, decides about uh, the use of knowledge and the direction into which it is developed. Uh, so this is one set of questions uh, that we have here. Uh, the second set of questions is um, having to do with uh, bringing political econom economy and knowledge production together into our historical inquiry. So I think this is actually a question of political epistemology to see how on one side uh, the political and economic um, uh, needs and um, circumstances of a society are related to uh, the cognition, uh, the collective uh, knowledge or the shared knowledge uh, that is um, developing within uh, a society. Um, and then there's a third set of questions that we did not discuss so much up to now, but uh, to which Babu will um, have a concrete contribution um, that is um, related to innovative ways in which we as historians could disseminate our research. And I think it's not only about uh, dissemination but also about cooperation and about um, doing the research itself because the means uh, to disseminate knowledge uh, via the internet for instance are at the same time working tools uh, for us uh, where we can uh, maybe in, in certain electronic environments make use of them to, um, uh, to find new ways of doing research and to address certain questions. So these are the three sets of questions that, um, uh, that I think we already touched upon in our discussions, but which I would propose now to um, take as a starting point for a broader discussion. So I would open the floor now for everybody who wants to say something uh, to these points, maybe starting uh, with the first set of questions on the primary historical agents uh, in the history of standardization. The state, the practitioner, uh, practitioner or the public? What is your answer? <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
This is more like a comment I wanted to make on Melissa's paper, and then there was some time, but it's got to do with the question of the agents. And um, I really like the fact that you uh, put on the table the question of alienation from knowledge, because it seems to me that when it comes to um, measurement, for instance, which is one of the um, main practices that we looked at, um, across the board there's a real um, keenness on the part of the public to have a stake. I mean, they have a stake in it, but to kind of, you know, claim their stake in it. For instance, both in the material that M Melissa was talking about and material that I've also seen in the rest of my research, there seems to be an emphasis on personal agency in the measurement practice. So a lot of the material from Egypt, as Melissa pointed out, um, includes in the formulae almost, um, that people have measured a certain amount for themselves, that they've given out a certain amount with their own hands. Um, you find something similar even if you look, and I don't read the demotic, but I've tried to make a bit of a comparison between the Greek and the demotic that you find sometimes in the same archive. There seems to be this kind of uh, claiming a stake to personal agency in, in these measurements, which I think is quite interesting because it chimes in with what we were saying about this is interpersonal. It's not just about this kind of allegedly impersonal agent state that sweeps in and does stuff. Yes, but I'm not sure if I have it articulated well. <laughs> I think that's, that's true um, and notice that about uh, both our papers too. I think in the, something that's been preoccupying me in the Roman context is that um, it's not just depending on the time period and the sources I'm looking at, of course, because they're fragmentary, but it's not just the state and the public that I see, but the state, you know, as the imperial government and then also households or sort of elites and what they can do and then the public, but there's different kinds of publics because there's like the village or the merchant or the tenant. Um, and so in in thinking of who is the agent, I've almost started thinking not, not exactly who's driving standardization as an abstract process, but who has the ability to, um, to build these networks that I guess allow them to claim a stake in the measurement, to use Serafina's um, phrasing. And that might be more complicated than just standardization versus not standardization. Um, I, I think um, the idea of network is important. Network. network that Melissa just mentioned is important to introduce types of context for addressing the issue of standardization. Namely, you cannot expect that there is, as you said, um, the same approach, the same um, shaping of standardization everywhere, but across a network, you might expect. And so the next question, I mean, and I think um, my feeling, I'm not at all an economic historian, but my feeling is that it's a notion that is badly needed in economy, where in fact uh, we assume a kind of uniformity that we might experience today, but it might be a really very uh, big assumption. And so if we agree that the notion of network is important, how can we identify the networks? Namely, uh, if we agree that we should describe standardization in this context, uh, then the next question is, 
how do we identify? For instance, just to, to, I mean, the origin of my question is again in um, grains in ancient China. Because there is, there are official documents standardizing how you exchange uh, coarse, um, unhusked millet and coarsely husked millet and paddy rice and so on. But these standards, in my view, only hold within the, the network of the imperial administration. But if you go to the market, my hunch is that these um, do not hold. And so you have, uh, here you have, in, that's my feeling, I cannot establish this point for the moment, that's a hypothesis, but you have very amazing standardization for centuries about rate of exchanges, but only within a kind of economic circuit and not at all on the markets where you have evidence that prices changed and not in the same uh, proportion. So it's really crucial to identify the networks in relation to our issue, but how? One might add that uh, not only the royal uh, uh, administration and the market are different, but uh, everybody uh, us have different practices and we tend to see in our own practices that which is modern. And uh, so we see well the early uh, 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 Mesopotamia uh, it did not have a number concept bec uh, because sometimes they express things with, uh, uh, in a metronautic notation and some things they just le leave out uh, uh, the, the unit. Uh, so they couldn't have a, a modern no number concept and no nobody thinks about what we do ourselves in many cases. So for Nolatou, at least for writers, we were me never modern. And uh, uh, that is, we can uh, uh, try to identify, and the parameters we have in each different case is are, dif uh, are different. That makes it, uh, it difficult, of course. But we can at least be awake to uh, aware of the possibilities to find things which we don't expect to find. I think, in answer to Karin's question. There are now enough big data, maybe I'm being over optimistic, in the Greek and Roman world that if one had the time, the research time, and it could actually be done. I mean, back to the question that Matthias, I think, was asking me about the weights and the steel yards. Often we do have provenance. So imagine, you know, if I had the, the resources of Max Planck and, you know, like three years in front of me, one could map that, look at all the data, see for instance which, if there are clusters around a certain unit of measure, put it on a, on a map, see where the clusters are, if there are any names or if there's any archaeological provenance in terms of, you know, the site, then one could try and start, you know, doing networks. Or back to the the Egypt situation, now we do have, you know, there's a big database for the papyri. The ones that can be organized in archives are organized in archives. There's, you know, we know quite a lot about the archaeological context in places like Karanis, for instance. Um, one could see if, you know, what the clusters look like in a place like Oxyringus or Karanis, where there's a lot of material from. It would still not cover the entirety of the ancient Mediterranean that we look at, but it would be a start because now, you know, there's enough material online that you can do that job. You still need time, but more, more quickly. And then when it's done, we could try to decide what those clusters or patterns mean. So maybe it's an idea for a big grant application somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know. In any case, 
case, I think it relates to what Babu will um, present uh, a little later, that is um, the idea of using uh, electronic tools uh, for, for such, a, such an approach. And um, things of this kind are ongoing, so I don't think it's completely utopian to think also of the Roman uh, weights uh, being integrated in such a, such a system. I think partly it's already done, but um, I think um, um, more has to be done in this uh, direction to, to, to get a more complete picture. Yeah, I agree. Um, further comments or uh, points on, uh, on the question of agency? Yeah. Or no? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just another question, please. No, um, I, I had the discussion of a lunch with Jens, uh, um, and he had an interpretation, and um, I had another one that was about um, um, an artifact that Serafina projected, and whose name is, I always forget, the... Uh, now I also forget. Modus, the, <laughs> the modus, is that right? The modus, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was struck by the fact that um, the inscription bore um, the um, capacity and the weight because that reminded me of another um, artifact with uh, imperial um, stamps and inscriptions and everything in China in which um, it's a set of vessels put on a given artifact, but the inscription makes clear that the uh, inner cylinder for the inner cylinder for the biggest capacity unit has a height which is um, the measurement unit for length. That is to say, you have several standard units on the same artifact. So that goes back to the issue we discussed of relationship between um, systems, not systems of measurement unit and how in fact artifacts are not always for one um, type of measurement unit but integrating um, different types. So in Jens's interpretation, the, the inscription of the weight on the artifact might be related with the fact that people might have weighed grain and subtracted the um, weight of the artifact. Do you think that was the possible use of this inscription? My interpretation was just that it was the weight of the artifact itself which was indicated. That was what I interpreted what you said, that uh, uh, it seems to be a bit low, but that there could be some part missing. So that was just my inter interpretation, what you said. That was all I, I had. Uh, no. Averfield says, that that must have been the weight. And then when he checked it, he was, you know, there was a discrepancy which he inter... Mm. I don't remember off the top of my head, but... Uh, um, not even that, I'm very bad with these things. Uh, the information is obviously in Haverfield. But uh, you will also find that a lot of uh, uh, these protocols use essentially um, the material collected in Friedrich Husch's metrology collection, which is very, very old, so old that inevitably it doesn't contain, for instance, some new papyrological material. But still, it's like there's nothing quite like it. So even uh, recently, people still go back to Hulsh that has got some figures for, you know, the absolute value of things like that. Have you found it? Yes. <laughs> so 
A sextarius would have been between 500 milliliters and 580 milliliters. This is from Wikipedia, so <laughs> take that into account. <laughs> Instead of the uh, carvoran modules, I sometimes um, I, I could also have used the example of some uh, vessels from classical Athens. There's a whole succession of them that have been interpreted as official. And the testing is never quite the same. So you find that, that for instance, people use lentils to measure capacity, or they use grain, and obviously the measurements are different, or they use pines instead of some other unit of measurement. So there's a lot of diversity even in the so-called protocol. So it's not surprising that then none of these standards is really a good standard. I thought very interesting in the context of this particular vessel was also the use of the word exactus. If I understood correctly, that, that didn't mean that it was um, accurate, but that it was officially confirmed in a way. Um, Interesting. Any further comments uh, on the broader picture emerging from, from our two days? Uh, the uh, relation of uh, knowledge production with, um, uh, with high social hierarchies or the political uh, economics uh, involved. I'm looking at you, Babu. <laughs> I don't have the synthesis, but <laughs> well, just another thought that emerged from everything is, and one thing I'm finding troubling and trying to identify, like networks, for example, is that some agents or networks tend to be a lot more visible than others. So I think there's the risk of thinking that they were all there was. So like governmental ones tend to be very visible. I think that's come up in a lot of um, contexts. And so, um, in the Roman context, for example, from Egypt, there's tons and tons of documents related to taxation and to estates. There's not actually that many that relate to merchants. So I'm very interested in the networks that merchants might have made with each other, or their, their mechanisms for trust, or their um, if they shared numerical practices, what might they have shared? And um, I, at least so far, haven't found much at, at all. So you... Um, yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> Some kinds of evidence are more visible than others. I was gonna say, I've, I've been looking at some interesting archives of weavers. That's kind of the closest. If we think that weavers must have used some numeracy in their practice, which is an argument that other people have made, then sometimes uh, the apprenticeship contracts that are also often parts, part of the archive indicate that they would apprentice their children to other weavers. And then, you know, you can start building a network, reconstructing a network that way. And there are, you know, contracts. There's one contract of a loom being sold to another weaver, that kind of thing. But uh, it's not as good as if there was something with merchants. I agree. And there's a lot of tax, weaver's tax being paid, obviously. I was just thinking about uh, the context of work itself and if you could, uh, one way to enter into this world of uh, practices could be through the prism of work and the nature of work and how could we do that is, uh, and therefore the win invisible and the visible can c at least be pointed out. For instance, in the, uh, the measurement of pearls in South India, that text, I mean, once the oysters come up on the shore, only then you start looking for the pearls. But then the divers who are fishermen, I mean, the labor process itself conditions uh, the process right from the beginning, and they are not involved further on, right? So they know which oysters to pick and which to leave out, because these are people who dive about 40 to 60 meters on self-breathing without any assisted thing. I mean, they've always done it before. So if you go into them and then take an oral account, 
then they would say what would be left out and what comes out. So, <coughs> so work and labor process, be it the question of weaving, uh, I don't know, grain uh, merchants, like the farmers and the speaking to the grain merchant is another context in which you could. So there are instances in the economic history where we know uh, certain recorded transactions where the modes of exchange are recorded, then how do we bring those stories into these stories? I think it's, it's some kind of folding, like Professor Subrail was saying. Uh, folding was happening within the units, built into another Unix to come up with one common index, some kind of a project in commensuration that you wanted to do. Then how do you look for such epistemic practices like commensuration, aggregation, which we are talking about now, but something that has always, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, what Professor Babu said is, uh, uh, the work, if we look closely the question of work, um, actually uh, uh, the usual uh, understanding or the usual perspective which one can easily uh, work out is that work is uh, kind of a anthropocentric kind of act. But uh, if we closely look the process of work, we can see that there is an intersection, there is an interrelation between the human body's force and the force of nature. So there in the force of nature, there is the uh, force of the object also very decisive to uh, uh, the formulation of the idea of the or the knowledge or the system of uh, measure or system of the knowledge so we need, i think that if we consider the question of uh, agency we need to consider the question of uh, agency of man or at the same time question of agency of animal if it is possible uh, question of uh, agency of of this no uh, natural force and object otherwise uh, we will uh, seem to uh, slip to a trap of uh, mere andro centric uh, no human centric kind of uh, understanding about uh, the process and production of knowledge i think it is my tension in this regard anyone else yeah I completely agree with Arun. I mean, I think if you look at, I guess, the uh, one formulation of actor network theory, I Bruno Latour, where he says exactly that objects are part of the network. So yeah, I think absolutely, uh, I agree with you. Um, I, if I put myself into the discussion, I have difficulties actually in seeing objects uh, as actors or as agents in the way humans are. Um, but uh, a degree to which I understand this uh, thesis is that, of course, uh, the objects and uh, the material world uh, does play a role and uh, there is a resistance, so to speak. So when we think of um, cognitive developments in, in, in societies, we clearly have to think of the, of the social dimension, um, of the, of the um, human agency dimension, but also of the material dimension um, that, um, that may explain different things. For instance, commonalities, as we have seen them here in many examples uh, in different societies that are not necessarily connected by knowledge transfer. Any, yeah, you want to? I hate to be doing no more of the talking, but um, I've been reading more and more about distributed cognition, which is kind of obviously compatible with actor network theory and with the situation specific theory. And I've, so far, I think I'm finding it very useful. So it's again this idea that, I mean, you 
do you want to talk about distributed cognition? Because it sounded like that's what you were talking about. He's very much within um, um, uh, uh, concentrated cognition. I didn't expect this to become a, a, a discussion about my uh, <laughs> world, <laughs> but um, I could say something uh, to it. Um, so, I mean, we could discuss it in more detail, but this would uh, lead um, above our uh, time frame here. Um, no, I see the point in, uh, in, in distributed cognition. I'm not sure if I would use the term cognition in that sense, I would rather reserve cognition, as, as Roy just pointed out, for a more uh, local, let's say, or um, uh, um, um, a phenomenon. But, um, but via the uh, external knowledge representations, let's say, uh, via the material uh, representations, symbolic representations, and so on, uh, that um, that serve the communication of knowledge and that serve the handing down of knowledge from generation to generation, um, I think it is clear that the knowledge that we as historians are interested in uh, is uh, collective knowledge. It's uh, the structures of collective knowledge and, um, and the collective knowledge development. Individual ideas uh, may always occur and then vanish again in history as long as these structures are not uh, externalized uh, in a material way and stabilized by um, societal institutions um, that um, that support them for a certain amount of time so that they get um, um, that there's some con continuity in the development um, they cannot become part of a, of a history of knowledge uh, uh, that we are interested in um, I, I will dare to try to maybe integrate a little bit some of the uh, uh, things that uh, have been said. Um, I'm trying to think about the question of uh, uh, measurement and the question of the, the, the uses of measurement, not to call it the practicality of calculation or the practicality of measurement, but the uses of measurement in a, in a broader sense uh, or, or of calculations. And I want to bring in uh, uh, the human agent and the material agent and uh, uh, Melissa's network uh, uh, together. And maybe the question then could be, given a certain calculation or given a certain measurement uh, to follow uh, its network of distribution and then ask how stable or how predictable does it uh, how stably or how predictably does it replicate itself throughout the network? Uh, how far does it reach in a stable or predictable way? And this could be a question both about uh, the uniformity of measurements and about how useful or what use does a calculation or a measurement have. So it can be about uh, the sacks of grain from going from the village uh, uh, in Egypt all the way to Rome what happens to the name of the quantity along the line or to the comparability of the quantities along the line. It could be about the calculations in the manuscript that I'm looking at, what happens when you translate or transcribe one uh, uh, a manuscript to another, how stable the terms or the calculation or the result uh, remain, whether there is a distribution from the network of copyists and, and school children to the network, to the network of uh, people calculating in the market in a stable or predictable way. Maybe this is a way of putting some of the terms and questions we have been discussing together. I start out, I start out by objecting to you, if we have individual knowledge which uh, uh, we know was available to others that was not taken up but forgotten, then that is very informative also about the connections you are speaking about. One example, Chukis L uh, innovations in algebra which are not taken up by the guy who copied from his manuscript, who just yeah. transformed everything into uh, the simple things he knows. So that is a case of what we are, explicitly, time wasn't ripe. Yeah. Uh, con conditions were not ripe to make it useful. Yeah, I completely agree. I wrote my dissertation on somebody <laughs> who, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 
I wrote my dissertation on somebody who was completely uh, neglected in, in what he did in his manuscripts. But you have the manuscripts, so you have a material representation yeah, yeah, of, of what they did. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So we know this. Yeah, you're right. Anybody else? Otherwise, I would uh, propose that Babu, you uh, quickly present um, uh, what I think relates to the third point I, I was making, and then we go on. Would you want to use this or? Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad uh, the visualization of diversity, that's what we had in mind when we started out with this idea, and then therefore the, the immediate uh, way of imagining that was in the form of an atlas, thanks to Professor Subrail, who have been working in the last 10 years to produce a historical atlas for South India using inscriptions. Then we thought when me and Roy were writing up the proposal, we thought we'll add a layer to the metrology atlas, to the historical atlas, and how does it come about? It's a, it's a kind of a thought to see. So I have a fantastic team of uh, free software movement volunteers uh, who have committed themselves to uh, on the technical side. And they insisted that, you know, they put together a presentation saying what all they have done in the last one year uh, in contributing uh, to this project. I will skip uh, the work that they most I'll just focus on the historical atlas for the lack of time. I mean, it started with, uh, you know, designing fonts in Tamil so that it becomes freely available, the Unicode font. Uh, so, so that we can publish across platforms, you know. So that's one work that they have, I think, more or less completed that they wanted to report. And then uh, on the, in terms of the historical atlas, I wish I could show you a, a live atlas thing, but uh, still the work is in progress. So, I mean, this is what they're saying, that th the currently the restructuring of the atlas uh, is the process is going on. And then the idea is to bring it into this, what they call the thematic spatial temporal framework. I'll just show what it is. So this is the older version of the atlas as it was. So you study an inscription, and then uh, you know if the objects interest you, then you have the geolocation of the thing from the inscription, you map it onto the uh, spatial uh, platform. Now it was restructured into things. So these are in most parts of South India. So you can filter them on the side using whatever indexes that you have. And then so the numbers denote at that particular location what kind of how much information in terms of number of inscriptions is available. So that if you can search according to the index on the right and the filter on the right, then it will get, you know, for instance, you know, the use of pottery. You, you know, you have to look for objects of pottery or metal objects, something, then you get the locations. It's a, a based on, I mean, the data is extracted from inscriptions and then mapped onto the uh, spatial thing. So using this version, uh, which, also, I mean, that's what it looks like now using the filters. So if you choose one particular location, and then see the name of Vadakapati. Then you have certain details, certain images, and then uh, yeah. And so and it's not so visible. The green column will say fetch details, and then whatever information is available about that particular uh, village or the location, then we get the details out of it. So that's how it is. Now to build a You know, to bring in the thematic, which is in the case of metrology, we have uh, collating information about linear volume, like it shows in the, yeah. So linear volume, weight, time, uh, and money also we have uh, added. So having gone through the published inscription so far, which are called South Indian inscriptions, there are several volumes of it. Then we color the information time-wise and then organize it along the axis on the left. So the theme, space, uh, metrology, and the temporal, and uh, that is the work that we are uh, doing right now. So, yeah, I just wanted to show, I mean, what 
it might look like. So any kind of feedback on how to improve this or any other things that you come across will be useful. The other thing that I just wanted to, as we move along the 17th, 18th century, then we get a lot more texts, like the Pearl text and the Kanakadiharam that we talked about. Then we'll have to integrate them into the atlas itself in some form. Then one way is to build an archive for the project. I mean, right now it's in a very rudimentary form, but then so Tamil, Malayalam, it could be language-wise. Then you want to organize a brief description of what are the texts available, where it is located. And then some brief description will come up about the text so that, uh, so one has to see there are two challenges left. One is to integrate the textual resources also in the spatial thematic uh, framework, and that's one. And the second thing is, okay, if you are a historian looking only for the spread of a particular volume measure across regions or across time, then how do you get the data out of it? I mean, there is a Excel sheet that's behind the map, but then it should be able to come out and filter. So these are the two major tasks that is left to do for the 2020, uh, for the coming year. Yeah, that's one. So uh, also in the overall sense, uh, I mean, Professor S.R. Sarma uh, was a very senior historian. I tried to get some feedback from him. So there is also this increasing fatigue about, you know, he called it, you are just dumping sources into one site and then ask people to respond to that uh, dumping. Then how do you uh, expect people to, you know, understand this? So how does a historian then mediate between a lot of information, which looks a lot of, so till now we thought nothing is available, and suddenly everything is one place and it looks like a lot of information. Then uh, how, do you, how do you actually mediate and what is the pedagogic role of such an archive or an atlas? So if it is context dependent, then what kind of context and audience? Is it the high school classroom or is it the professional historian? or is it you know, kind of inspiring uh, graduate students to get more into study of history of uh, mathematics? You know, then how do we have a single format and then appeal to different audiences? That's the other challenge we are still uh, thinking about. Yeah, thanks. Yes. I'm sorry, my, 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 rea my, my second reaction is also the, the perennity of the server because you, you put things on online, you do all this elaborate thing, and then, you know, we have to be sure that uh, the place that, that you have is gonna, is gonna be there. Yeah. I'm sorry, that was <laughs> just the immediate reaction. Yeah, these, uh, these trends are very fiercely free <laughs> software. They don't want to situate an archive like this uh, they respect collective work because if people contribute to this, it's almost like sourced. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's partly supported by the British Library, when me and Roy did the Endangered Archives project, did a survey, but then it was collective. You know, people went out, contributed, work. so they don't want to situate it in any institutional server. And you'll never know when a project finishes. Maybe the server space is also uh, over. the free software movement uh, volunteers who are developing this program. So they're trying to develop an independent server, crowdsourcing money for that, and so on, so yes. Anyway, this is a work in progress, so I thought I will just uh, Um, this is just a thought about, I guess, uh, getting people to know about it and then use it for different purposes. So if there are, 
large scale conferences that you go to. Um, I know in, in classics or, or ancient history, there's more and more showcases and sessions at conference about conferences about digital methodologies um, or kind of maker spaces or just places where people demonstrate technologies or sessions where people show what they've taught using it or projects that they've had using it. So um, you could, when it's finished, organize some sessions like that around the resource. Um, if there's a large scale conference that would work as a place for that. Among the different audiences, we should not forget the amateurs. They could be a very val valuable resource. Uh, if you go to the National Lab Library in Jerusalem, you will always find, find the, um, uh, uh, um, I think more than half the people that would sit in the microfilm room would not be professors, and they are not students, they are uh, religious people who want to look at the test, text very often transcribe and even publish them uh, as a, uh, w without being uh, uh, professionally engaged in this. And I think this um, could happen very well uh, with many of the ki this kind of sources, uh, people who uh, retire and are interested in this and often had a very good uh, classical education to actually decipher the manuscripts in the language. Uh, um, younger volunteer uh, uh, um, uh, networks who are into uh, changing the image of knowledge and bringing up the role of the vernacular. Uh, th there are a lot of people who can turn these um, uh, manuscripts into something uh, readable and reproducible and, and useful for uh, a wider community. But the question is, of course, how do we reach them? How do we engage them? This obviously does not come for free. Nobody else? Just a feedback would be nice. That's all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, right now it is just zooming down into layers of information available, and uh, so, for instance, you click this. Uh, no. supposed to have some information stored into the thing. Yes, thank you. Yeah? Yes, I, I think if there is a growing interest in data collection, it gets more and more important. I mean, you also have them for manuscripts, you have them for letters, you have them also the historical dictionary tries to build in things, pictures, etc. This is a very important thing you do here, really. So I think uh, this ends uh, our joint journey. <laughs> so let us thank the organizers uh, once again for this marvelous uh, workshop.